Hi everyone! Welcome to part 4 of our return trip to the 1970s to take a look at even more fads from the golden era of great music, tacky fashions, and the double nickel speed limit. It was a wonderful and somewhat strange time to be alive with fads and trends that can boggle the mind when gazed upon through the lens of a 21st century perspective. So strap on your moon boots, tease out your feathered hair with that back pocket goody comb, and settle in to take a look back at the sometimes weird, always awesome, and perhaps forgotten fads of the 1970s. Hot Pants and Tube Tops The theme here was to show more skin, and boy did they ever! Probably an extension of the miniskirt trend of the late 1960s and early 1970s, the minimization of fabric content on clothing and maximization of body surface area exposure extended to other types of clothing beyond the skirt. Hot pants and tube tops were just the thing to show that you embraced the new skin is in fashion freedom of the early 1970s. Hot pants were just short shorts and a variety of fabrics such as velvet, silk, satin, and even fur. Two tops were shoulderless, sleeveless women's garments with internal elastic banding that wrapped around the upper torso. Both of these were popular from the early 1970s, but the hot pants fad died out near the mid-1970s while the tube tops stayed around for a few years longer. Both of these fashion fads enjoyed a resurgence in popularity beginning in the 1990s. Tang who didn't want to be like an astronaut in the 1960s and 1970s? Back then, the efforts and success of the US space program was on full display in TV, movies, and in print. America was proud of its achievements, and people were eager to embrace the theme. We were number one, and the space race helped us get there, and the timing was perfect to tie in a consumable product that had an association to the rocket-powered accomplishments of the day. That's where General Foods stepped up and promoted the fact that Tang, its powdered drink mix product, was used by astronauts on NASA missions starting in 1962 on the Gemini mission. Invented in 1957 by the same guy who invented powdered egg whites, Pop Rocks, and Cool Whip, sales of the product were poor until General Foods began marketing the powder as a space-age drink and enjoyed an accompanying sales lift-off trajectory into the powdered drink mix photosphere. The contents of the original Tang Space Age Elixir were mostly sugar at 94% of its dry weight, some flavoring, vitamin C, and some calcium to hold one's bones together while orbiting the planet. Bad Diets and Supplements Every era has its miracle weight loss method that declares someone has discovered a magic-like solution for shedding those extra pounds. Some of these become popular so quickly and then die out just as fast that they can be declared a full-on fad. In the late 1970s, an extremely popular weight loss fad diet was the Scarsdale diet. It was based on a diet regime developed and published by Dr. Herman Tarnauer and advocated a low-carb, high-protein diet that would last between 7 to 14 days. Did it work? Yes, it somewhat worked for a short period of time, but encouraged unhealthy and unbalanced eating habits that resulted in unsustainable weight loss and maintenance outcomes. The 1970s also had lots of other fad weight loss diets and supplements like the Last Chance Diet. This diet was also contained within a book and was based on the author's liquid protein drink called Prolin, which unfortunately was comprised of liquefied animal bones and hooves. There were also diet pills like Dexatrim, whose primary ingredient was an amphetamine called PPA that definitely gave the users some pep, but also unfortunately caused some dangerous side effects. Tacky Auto Features What do 1970s era Chevrolet Corvettes, Lincoln Continentals, and Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser station wagons have in common? They are just some of many examples of automotive feature fads from the 1970s that manufacturers offered on their cars to glom on to those oh-so-fantastic and tacky 1970s trends. The sporty T-top option appeared on many car models from the domestic automakers, such as the Pontiac Firebird, the Chrysler Cordoba, the Ford Mustang II, and the Oldsmobile Cutlass. If one's tastes veered towards a more Baroque aesthetic, the Opera window could be had on the Lincoln Continental Mark V, 
the Mercury Cougar, or a Cadillac Coupe de Ville. And then finally, there's the faux wood grain applique stickers that car makers slathered on the sides of everything from the traditional station wagon to a Chevy El Camino to a Ford Pinto. These were all just the thing to make the scene cruising down the main drag on a Saturday night while waiting in gas lines to fuel up your 1970s Detroit iron. Pyramid Power During the 1970s, the quickest and most effective way to amplify your thought forms, enhance your virility, sharpen your razor blades, and even preserve food was to place a pyramid over them. Or so the authors of a couple of popular books from the 1970s era declared. The theory was framed upon some pseudoscience experiments performed in the 1930s and 1940s that purportedly uncovered the mystical power of the three-dimensional triangle facet form based on the theory that ancient Egyptian pyramids conveyed mystical power upon the objects placed within. Based on this pyramid theory, the books published in the 1970s hyped up the power of pyramids and soon the craze caught on. One could purchase three-dimensional frames to sleep under and also place items under to tap into this spurious New Age phenomena. Some people have even built pyramid structures to reside in, or as religious temples, believing that they confer mystical benefits to those that dwell within. Upon scrutiny using scientific methodology, no evidence was discovered that supports the claims of pyramid power benefits. Others also thought the idea was bogus at the time. The band The Alan Parsons Project featured an image of one of the book's covers on the album Pyramid that mocked the idea. Tube socks. Tube socks were everywhere in the mid to late 1970s. Ankle and calf length socks were suddenly yesterday's look and the rush was on to cover everything below the knee. The fad got started when tube socks started showing up on professional sports players in the NBA, NFL, and soccer. Tube socks were a new innovation in the late 1960s when a novel manufacturing technique was developed. Tube sock popularity got a boost when they are adopted by these superstar athletes and celebrities. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Pele, Julius Dr. J. Irving, Farrah Fawcett and Charlie's Angels, and Raquel Welch in the roller derby movie, Kansas City Bomber. Biorhythms. This is another fad that falls into the category of pseudoscience and could actually be the subject of an entire video chronicling its rise and fall from all the rage to complete indifference in the 1970s. Biorhythm charts start showing up in daily newspapers, in home computer applications, and even custom individualized biorhythm charts could be commissioned from businesses that specialize in these. Did they work? Some people and organizations thought so, with some NFL teams consulting biorhythm charts for players on their own teams and opposing teams to help with draft picks and roster decisions. Professional gamblers even consulted biorhythms to try and gain a sports betting edge. Biorhythms fell out of fashion by the early 1980s and were debunked by several controlled experimental studies that concluded the theory was as bogus as a $3 bill. King Tut Craze The King Tut phenomenon was kicked off in the U.S. in November of 1976 with a museum exhibition tour that saw stops at seven major cities and ended on September 30th, 1979. The artifacts from the Egyptian tomb of the boy king Tutankhamun were seen by over 8 million people and profited over $10 million that was allocated to the Egyptian Museum for refurbishment. Not only was the tour a great blockbuster success for its organizers, the Egyptian government and the US government, it also spawned an intense interest in ancient Egyptian culture and societies with bounteous souvenir merch sales Tut mania engulfed everyone from Elizabeth Taylor to Andy Warhol to Jimmy Carter. During his fifth appearance as host of Saturday Night Live on April 22nd, 1978, comedian Steve Martin debuted his song King Tut as a parody of the craze that was sweeping across the land at the time. Chain Letters Chain letters have been around for a very long time, but they seem to be very popular in the 1970s. With fad-like frequency, 
These populated people's mailboxes like seagulls at a french fry festival. It was supposed to work by propagation of an exponentially growing pyramid of receivers and senders, where the sender would receive thousands of replies with an item or money included. The letters varied in theme and content. Some asked the receiver to offer prayers to the people listed on the letter, while other letter types asked for postcards to be sent, while the most common type was the Prosperity Club variant, where the receiver was asked to send money. The Prosperity Club type was a get-rich-quick scheme that rarely worked and most likely qualified as a wire fraud crime. These are still around today but are mostly sent in electronic form. Designer Jeans the popularity of Levi's, Lee, and Wrangler jeans in the 1960s and 1970s were widespread and worn by multitudes of young people throughout the land. Invented in the 1800s as workwear for California gold rush miners, the garment was romanticized in cowboy western movies in the 1920s and 1930s, adopted a rebellious image in the 1950s, was the uniform of the counterculture movement in the 1960s, and ascended a rock and roll stairway to heaven in the early 1970s. Yes, they were firmly ensconced as an attire must-have for the young and cool crowd, but for the manufacturers of jeans, the profit margins on these were low. Arriving to rescue jeans from their low-profit bourgeois market positioning predicament, designers like Elio Ferrucci, Gloria Vanderbilt, Calvin Klein, and Jordash introduced expensive and exclusive body-clinging jeans that were a hit on the runway and in those ultra-hip, culture-defining hotspots like Studio 54 in New York. Keeping even more fuel on the designer jeans' popularity and coolness fire, they were marketed with a racier image in print and TV ads. The fad caught on and spread quickly in the late 1970s and early 1980s before subsiding somewhat after that. Fear not, 1970s refugees. You can still buy super expensive designer jeans by designers Versace, Dolce & Gabbana, Dior, and others. We covered just a few more of the fads from the 1970s in this video, but rest assured we have lots more left to shine a spotlight upon for future videos. This video is number 4 of the 1970s fad series. Be sure to check out the first 3 on this channel as well as videos about fads from the 1980s and 1990s. As always, thanks for watching and be sure to like, subscribe and share to help keep this channel going.